Dad died on the 1st of October 2018. Today is his birthday and he would have been 62. Since he's died, it's become so apparent how much he meant to everyone and what a truly great person he was. He always had time for everyone. What I'm going to do today, I'm going to read out a letter he left for me and Tom. And I'm going to read out the words that I said at his funeral so that they don't get forgotten. And so that um, my daughter, Blake, can um, find out a little bit of, of what a great man he was. Since he, since he passed away, we've raised over £8,000 for the anti Nolan Trust and we've got dozens of donors onto, um, onto the register. So if you're watching this, I'll put the link in the description so that you can donate. Um, but what's more important is that awareness is raised so that more donors can get on the register. So please, if you're, uh, especially if you're 16 to 30 and, and male uh, and, and fit and healthy and all that, please consider becoming a donor. You don't have to do anything, you just got to get your, your name on the register. So here it goes. My very dear sons, without you, my life would have lacked meaning and purpose. I hope I have made it clear throughout my life how much I love you. I am equally proud of you, and I hope our love of sport is inherited from you to your children, in the same way I inherited it from your granddad. Look after and help one another whenever you can. Have the courage to be honest when you're wrong and help those less fortunate than yourselves. Through you, I still laugh and cry, but most importantly of all, love, Dad. My funeral, I would like a simple coffin because it's just going to go up in smoke. I don't want flowers at my funeral other than a large single white rose, hashtag Yorkshire. Instead, I would like donations to go to the Anthony Nolan Trust. I'll put that in the description. I don't want it to be a sombre affair, and I would like the dress code to be any type of sportswear, the brighter the better. For you two, I have exactly the same shirts that the Bradford Bulls players wore at Wembley. That's this. Flick a coin if you both want the same colour. I would like a rugby ball on top of my coffin and my linesman's flag. Please remove them before I'm cremated and decide what you want. I don't want a church service because I believe it makes it more painful for those who are close having to attend two services. Instead, I just want a simple service at Navwood. I would like the following hymn and he lists Jerusalem. <laughs> Got a great rugby song. I had the pleasure and privilege of being the best man for Mike Ward and Mike Gaunt and we have been good friends for more than 40 years. I want you to thank them and Mark and Gordon for all the happy times we have shared together. The music I would like is run by Snow Patrol on the way in and the air that I breathe by the Hollies at the end. They're not my all time favorite songs, but listen to the lyrics, they're for you. When my ashes are ready to be collected, I would like them to be spread along the, the length of the touch line between the first and second team pitches. We did that on Yorkshire Day, the 1st of August. I cried while I composed this document, and all the bravado about grown men shouldn't cry is nonsense. Don't bottle up your feelings, or your grief, but let it out. Live long, happy lives, believing that the glass is half full, and not half empty. All my love, Dad. So this is what I, um, what I said at his funeral. In the faint light of the attic, an old man, tall and stooped, bent his great frame and made his way to a stack of boxes that sat near one of the little half windows. Brushing aside a wisp of cobwebs, he tilted the top box towards the light and began to carefully lift out one old photograph album after another. Eyes once bright but now dim searched longingly for the source that had drawn him here. It began with the fond recollection of the love of his life, long gone, and somewhere in these albums was a photo of her he hoped to rediscover. Silent as a mouse, he patiently opened the long buried treasures, and soon was lost in a sea of memories. Although his world had not stopped spinning when his wife left it, the past was more alive in his heart than his present aloneness. Setting aside one of the dusty albums, he pulled from the box what appeared to be a journal from his grown son's childhood. He could not recall ever having seen it before, or that his son had ever kept a journal. 
Why did Elizabeth always save the children's old junk? He wondered, shaking his white head. Opening the yellowed pages, he glanced over a short reading, and his lips curved in an unconscious smile. Even his eyes brightened as he read the words that spoke clear and sweet to his soul. It was the voice of the little boy who had grown up too fast in this very house, and whose voice had grown fainter and fainter over the years. In the utter silence of the attic, the words of a guileless six-year-old worked their magic. I carried the old man back to a time almost totally forgotten. Entry after entry stirred a sentimental hunger in his heart, like the longing a gardener feels in the winter for the fragrance of spring flowers. But it was accompanied by the painful memory that his son's simple recollection of those days were far different from his own, but how different. Reminded that he had kept the daily journal of his business activities over the years, he closed his son's journal and turned to leave, having forgotten the cherished photo that originally triggered his search. Hunched over to keep him from bumping his head on the rafters, the old man stepped to the wooden stairway and made his descent, then headed down a carpeted stairway that led to the den. Opening a glass cabinet door, he reached in and pulled out an old business journal. Turning, he sat down at his desk and placed the two journals beside each other. His was leather bound and engraved neatly with his name in gold, while his son's was tattered with the name Jimmy had been neatly scuffed from its surface. He ran a long skinny finger over the letters as though he could restore what had been worn away with time and use. As he opened his journal, the old man's eyes fell upon an inscription that stood out because it was so brief in comparison to other days. In his own neat handwriting were these words. Wasted the whole day fishing with Jimmy. Didn't catch a thing. With a deep sigh and a shaking hand, he took Jimmy's journal and found the boy's entry for the same day, June the 4th. Large, scrawling letters pressed deeply into the paper read. Went fishing with my dad. Best day of my life. I read this um, to, to dad ten days before he died. Um, I hugged him and I tearfully thanked him for being better than the old man in the story and for always being a great, interested, supportive father. I asked him to fight hard and to hold on so he could be a granddad to my kids and teach them the lessons he taught me. To my knowledge, I didn't keep a journal, but on the 22nd of October of last year, so that's 2017, he imparted these words of wisdom. The most important thing you can do for a person is take an interest in their passions. The most important thing you can do for a person is take an interest in their passions. I am my father's son. I must have been about 14 when this realisation dawned on me. Grandma showed me a black and white picture of my dad holding a lion cub. My initial confusion passed when Grandma said to me, This was your dad about your age. See how similar you look. Remarkable. Other than some small differences around the mouth, we were indistinguishable. I've always been proud of telling people that story. I've always been very proud to be my father's son, and not just because of his dashing good looks. Dad had an incredible set of values. With Dad's lifelong love of sport inherited from his father, it's no surprise that his values were similar to rugby's core values of teamwork, respect, enjoyment, discipline and sportsmanship. I'd like to add a few Martin Peel specific values in. Fairness, integrity, loyalty, honesty and interest. The most important thing you can do for a person is take an interest in their passions. Dad didn't feign interest. When he asked you about your life, about your passions, he genuinely wanted to know. He was actively interested, engaged, involved. He made you feel like you were the most important person on the planet and he did this sincerely and generally because he was absolutely interested in what you had to say and what you wanted to do. Take that from him. Let that be his legacy. Learn from him. Apply this to your life. The most important thing you can do for a person is take an interest in their passions. The evidence of this interest was most apparent in the outpouring of appreciation for Dad's life. 
We'd like to thank the thousands of people who have shown their love and interacted on social media over the last two weeks. Nearly 700 people have commented with some truly moving words about what a great and wonderful man he was. Hundreds more have got in touch privately with the same message. There's been an article in the Telegraph and Ar Argus about him from Bill Marshall, a match report from Doc Purvis, and a big mention in the game day programme from the week of his death. Although modest and humble, Dad moved people in a way rarely seen. The most important thing you can do for a person is take an interest in their passions. This uh, following is an adapted story written by Andy Whittaker in his book, The Art of Brilliance. Dad had two children and therefore hardly any spare time. Life revolved around his kids' social lives, taxiing them here, there and everywhere, getting them to rowing, swimming, rugby, trampolining, karate or a party. Dad got the times delivered on a Sunday. One of his pleasures was to sit and read the paper, not cover to cover, but 20 minutes on a Sunday morning. He always sat in his indented spot on the sofa and read for 20 minutes of relaxation. As you know, he was a sporting nut. So his habit was to start the paper from the back page, just in case Breath of Bulls had made the news. Picture the scene. In late October, a lovely autumnal morning, and he had just sat down with, his, with the times. Tom, age five, burst in. Dad, Dad, can you come and pick some conkers with me? Dad sighed. It was his quiet 20 minutes and reading the paper was one of his simple pleasures in life. Later, he soothed. I'll pick conkers with you later. But Dad, please, Tom, I can't go later because we've got rugby. We've got to pick conkers now. Dad glanced up from the paper. I can't go now, he explained, because I'm busy. <laughs> Tom may have only been five, but he wasn't stupid. Busy? Reading the paper? So he pressed on. Dad, do you know what conkers are? Dad then struggled to focus on the sports section. And whilst this five-year-old rattles on about how conkers are brown things that hang on trees and you can have conker fights, and with all the enthusiasm of a five-year-old, his eyes go wide when he explains to Dad that if the conker wins, it absorbs the life of the other conker. Yeah, eyes shining, he pushes for a different answer. So can we go now? Now, Dad thinks, he can outwit a five-year-old. He's firmly ensconced with his newspaper and is now mildly irritated that his son is stopping his 20 minutes of pleasure. Tell you what, Tom, he offers. When I was your age, Grandad used to let me pick conkers on my own. That way it was much more fun. Dad settled back to the paper, proud of this fob-off. It's classic management textbook stuff. Surely the lad will be empowered to sprint away to the tree and give Dad the peace he was craving. Dad looked up, interrupted once again. His irritation now growing, Tom's still there. The conkers are too high, Dad, says Tom. I need to go on your shoulders. And then he's upbeat again as an idea crosses his mind. Dad, he grins, we could fill a bucket with conkers. Then when we get home, we could polish them. That was it. Dad was now exasperated. He stands up, folding the paper in half before slapping it down on the armrest of the sofa. Bloody hell, he spits. I can't even get past the sports section without you whining about conkers. So yes, we will go and get some conkers, because otherwise all I will hear all morning is conkers, 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 and I won't get any peace until it's sorted, and guess who will end up clearing up the mess when you polish them. I've got a million and one other things to do, so we will go and get some conkers, but we will do it quickly. Thankfully, Tom hadn't heard the internal monologue. He had just heard the yes. And had scurried off to find his wellies as Dad whinged to himself. By the end of the moaning monologue, Tom had returned with wellies and a white bucket. His grin was huge as father and son set off down the road to the conquer tree. Now, spend a few seconds picturing the scene. Tom is clutching Dad's hand and swinging the bucket in the other. The little boy is singing a song about conkers. He's skipping. Dad, he's slouched and frowning, rolling his eyes and thinking how badly he wants to finish the paper. Wrong. Dad took personal responsibility for being brilliant and imagined how the best dad in the world would pick conkers. Back to the image, it's changed. We now have father and son skipping. Dad had joined in the conker song and makes up a silly and slightly rude second verse. Tom laughs. The net curtains twitch and the neighbours see two weirdos skipping down the street. 
They get to the conquer tree and Dad lifts Tom onto his shoulders. To Tom's delight, some of the conkers aren't quite ready, so are white and brown. He's thrilled, shouting out the colours as he adds them to the bucket. Tom comes down from Dad's shoulder and Dad throws a stick into the tree. It rains conkers and Tom scurries like a squirrel, collecting them, filling the bucket to overflowing. There are squeals of excitement as loads of other children join in the fun. Then homeward bound. Tom runs the last 50 metres to announce they've collected 212 conkers. Father and son spend some time deciding on the last 20, which are duly polished, strung up, and Dad teaches the lad the, the basics of conker fighting. Tom takes some conkers to school and plays with his mates in the playground. All in all, the conker episode took approximately two hours. That includes the walk, the gathering, the polishing, making holes, stringing, and practice. But do you know what? I can't think of a better use of two hours. All because in his life, Dad chose to be positive and took personal responsibility for making it happen. You can do that. Enjoy the little things because one day you may look back and realise that they were the big things. I told this story to Dad the other day. He said, should have taken a rugby ball. And we laughed as we recalled all the times we've got balls stuck in the trees over the years. The most important thing you can do for a person is take an interest in their passions. That was the main bit that I said. There was a, a couple of other bits that I'll read out now. Dad wasn't a church-going man, and neither am I, but I do have one particularly fond memory of going with him. It had got to that part in the church service where everyone stands to sing. I can't for the life of of me remember the hymn, but remember it was one I particularly enjoyed singing at school. The organists started playing their trade on the ivory, the lead pipes thundered into action, and to my pleasure, a volcano of baritone erupted beside me. It was my dad, and I was utterly encapsulated in wonder at his magnificent voice. Now, dad perhaps wasn't the best of singers. I can recall him murdering a rendition of Yesterday by the Beatles on holiday in Corfu, but what he lacked in vocal accuracy, he made up for in effort. Dad wasn't abashed and in textbook Martin Peel fashion sang his heart out with no shame or fear of what others thought. Dad has asked that any donations go to the Anthony Nolan Trust, link in description. The wake will be held at Bailden Rugby Club where a few words will be said and Dan Jowett has prepared a video celebrating his life and the good times we have all shared. I'll, sh I'll share the link as well, it'll be up here somewhere. Thank you everybody who has made it today. Those who have travelled from London, Scotland or further afield. Thank you for coming to pay your respects to a great man. Thank you to Rachel and the good people at HH Birch and Son for facilitating today. And thank you to Phil Wilson for creating the program and for those who have spoken this morning. In the timeless words of a great man. Many thanks. <laughs>